Hello everyone, today we are breaking down Season 1, Episode 2, Red Coast of the Three Body Problem. But before that, remember to like the video, it helps out the channel a lot, and subscribe, and yada yada yada, let's get to it. The first thing we see are people reacting to the universe blinking at them, which is when the stars flickered in the sky. Everyone in the world saw it, so everyone is talking about the strange event. Saul gets some groceries for Yao Wenxia. He and her daughter Vera were very close, so it makes sense that he would be helping her out during this trying time. Yao Wenxia asks him if he has a theory. He thinks it is a load of BS. You have to remember that Saul is really smart and is a physicist. If something can't be explained by science, then he believes it's a trick or a hoax. Though he does have proof to back this up, everyone in the world saw the flickering stars, but Earth's satellites never saw it. Why is this? Saul makes it sound like someone projected the flickering stars into the night sky, but to do it for the entire world would mean something would have to completely encircle the Earth to achieve this result. Which isn't out of the question, the Lord figure we heard about last episode can make people see numbers. We don't know the extent of their power. But that does bring up an interesting question. Is it just a trick or does this Lord have these kinds of mystical powers? We are now with Jin and Augie. They are outside the Nanotech Research Center. Augie has to make a decision whether to shut down the project or not. Remember that strange woman told her the countdown would disappear if she puts an end to her research. She also kind of threatened Augie saying that nothing good happens when the countdown gets to zero. The countdown is getting closer to zero so Augie must make a decision. We see Augie enter the building, fellow office workers are talking about the flickering stars from last night and want to know if Augie has any theories. Augie curtly says no. They don't know that the stunt was made for her so she's a bit sensitive to the subject. Augie enters the lab as they are about to do an experiment to see if the nanofibers they have been working on work. They are going to use them to cut a diamond. Now obviously there are more uses than that for it. The nanofiber, the one she invented, is said to be 3,000 times finer than human hair, invisible as air, and stronger than steel. So if the experiment is a success, the applications for this nanofiber are limitless. They do the test and it was a success. Augie is happy about it, but also terrified. If it wasn't a success, maybe the countdown would have stopped. The rest of the observers are clapping and congratulating Augie on her success. Augie tells them to shut it down and everyone is confused, it was a success. But Augie flexes her power as the chief scientific officer and orders it to be shut down. She leaves the room with tears in her eyes. She leaves the building hyperventilating, still seeing the countdown. It is about a minute away from zero, but then the countdown disappears, it is gone. Clarence is here to meet her. Clarence is the one who is investigating the suicides of the physicists and the people of the scientific community. He's been keeping tabs on the Oxford Five since Vera committed suicide. The Oxford Five are the main characters we have been following throughout the story. He introduces himself to Augie, but she believes he can't help her. He then asks if she wants to know why these stars flickered for her. So this obviously gets her attention. Maybe Clarence does know something about this whole situation. We are now in 1968 with Ya Winsia and Yang at Red Coast Base. They are transmitting messages out into the universe hoping to make contact with an alien race. Ya Winsia believes their signal is too weak. Winsia asks Yang to contact a scientist from California. Yang would prefer not to. America isn't exactly liked here and they will be questioned for it. Wencia says to tell nobody else about it then. Yang does what he is told. The American scientist replies and Yang gives Wencia his message. She smiles looking at the letter. She grabs a chalkboard and starts to explain her idea to Yang. So America observed strong bursts of electromagnetic radiation from Jupiter. Red Coast observed the same thing but 13 minutes after America but what they observed came from the sun and the signal was a million times stronger. So the sun not only reflected Jupiter's waves back towards the Earth, they amplified them, which is why the data they observed was stronger than what America observed. Wincia's idea is to use the sun as a super antenna. So basically to aim their message to other life forms at the sun, so then the message will be amplified and then they have a better chance of contacting another world. Yang thinks it's a brilliant idea. But Wencia also tells him it could take years before they get a response. She wants to tell Commissar Lee about her idea. Yang sighs when she says this and says yes, they should. 
We are still in 1968 and we see Yang telling Lee by himself this idea to amplify the signal. He has the chalkboard out and is explaining it to him like when Sia explained it to him. Lee says it is a radical idea. Yang says he has been working on it for quite some time. So Yang stole the idea and is now trying to take credit. When Sia comes into the room wanting to tell Lee about her idea. Lee asks if she could look over Yang's findings to make sure the math is correct for using the sun to amplify their signal. When Sia looks at Yang who looks a bit embarrassed that he was caught stealing her idea. When Sia's expression does not change though. Like she's used to being screwed over at this point. Nothing really surprises her. She says the math is correct and does not rat on Yang. Commissar Lee then gets mad about the idea, saying you want to aim a powerful radio beam at the sun, the red sun. Have you thought about the political symbolism? So the leader of China is supposed to be the red sun in the heart of the people. So Lee is saying that if we do this experiment, it seems like we are suggesting to kill the leader. Lee thinks if they do this, it could get them all executed and forbids it. When Sia is back at the control panel for the radar, she's a bit annoyed. She knows that her idea will work and she wants to do it. She looks around at the other workers at the base. They aren't really paying attention at all. She starts to aim the radar towards the sun. None of the other workers have noticed yet. If she is caught, she will be removed from the base and either will be executed or be in prison for disobeying a command. They send the transmission towards the sun and no one is the wiser. We're back in current times with Clarence and Augie. They are back at headquarters and are exchanging information about what they know about the flickering stars and the suicides. Clarence brings up the security footage of the night Augie spoke to that strange woman. And somehow the woman is not there. She has been scrubbed from the footage. Augie gets upset thinking Clarence does not believe her about the woman. But Clarence does believe her. You can see Augie's cigarette gets lit out of thin air. Clarence says that his tech guys couldn't find any trace of it being tampered with either. So whoever is behind all of this has some pretty crazy tech, which we already know. The flickering stars was a pretty good indicator of that. Clarence wants to know if Augie has any rivals or competitors, someone who would want her to stop her work. Augie says no, at least no one capable of all this. They start talking about the countdown Augie saw. Clarence tells her that other scientists have seen it too. And they all quit working. They either quit like Augie did or they quit like Vera. So suicide. So whoever is behind these attacks clearly has a problem with science and wants to put an end to any research being done. We're now with Jin in her apartment. She goes to put on the VR headset. Last episode, she took it off maybe five minutes into playing. There's nothing quite like it, so she wants to see what else is in the game. She puts it on and this time the desert landscape seems to be covered in snow. Two people come to greet her. A man and a young girl. He says he is the Count of the West and the girl is known as Follower. Jin is staring at them in awe. They look so real. She goes to touch the Count and he gets mad. He is of royal blood. She should know better. Jin realizes that these people are not actual people playing characters. They are NPCs. They ask for her name. Jin will not do here. She says Copernicus. Copernicus is a famous mathematician from the 1500s. They tell her what her mission is in this world, to solve the riddle of this world. Count and followers start heading towards the pyramid, Jin follows. Count explains some of the lore of the game. They are currently in a chaotic era. Except for stable eras, all times are chaotic. When a new era arrives, the emperor consults the great minds about the movement of the sun. Jin has to decide if the era will be chaotic or stable. If they are wrong, an entire civilization will be destroyed. So basically, if it is a stable era, life can prosper, a lot like how we live on Earth. If it is a chaotic era, there is no pattern. So it can get very hot one day where people die, or very cold. And sometimes the sun does not rise for months. Sometimes the sun stays in the sky for months. It is a chaotic era. The sun starts to rise, and Count and Follower go for cover under a rock. Jin follows. Count says there is room for only two of them here. That follower will have to dehydrate. She takes off her jacket, lays on the floor, and dehydrates. All that is left of her is basically just skin. The heat lets up and Count leaves the cover of the rock and he rolls up follower's skin like a blanket. Jin asks if she is dead and Count says no. 
He continues by saying that those who dehydrate quick enough can be preserved, that they can rehydrate them during a stable era. That is how people survive chaotic eras. If they dehydrate, they don't have to deal with the extreme weather and they don't starve or die of thirst. Jin takes off the headset once again, a bit confused at what this game is. She invites Jack over to get a look at the VR headset. He is into video games and all that kind of stuff, so maybe he will know more about it. He looks just as confused. There is no screen, no charging port, not even a logo. Jin tells him it's nothing she has ever seen before, that it is indistinguishable from reality. Jack puts the headset on, and he sees the desert and the pyramid. He's freaking out how real and amazing it is. He starts playing around, feeling the ground. He can taste the dirt. He has seen nothing like this before. We then hear a lady from behind him saying he was not invited and he gets his head cut off. He takes the headset off immediately, gasping for breath because he literally thought he just died. So this is interesting. The headset belonged to Vera initially, then Jin took it after her mother when Sia said she could have it. Yet when Jin put it on, she never got a you were not invited prompt. Why is that? So whoever's behind the headset wants Jin to have it. But why? So far we know only scientists seem to have this headset. So once again, whoever is behind this seems to be specifically targeting only the scientific community. Jin tells Jack that this is what Vera was playing before she killed herself, that maybe this had something to do with it. She does not think they should play it again. Jack being a gamer looks at her like, no no, I want to play some more. He puts the headset back on and once again is killed by the lady. Jin then puts the headset on to play some more. Jack is annoyed since she isn't getting her head cut off. We find out that Clarence has been listening in on their conversation. He has Jin's apartment bugged. As I've said before, he's been spying on all the Oxford Five. We're now with Clarence. He is at a graveyard visiting his dead wife. It is her birthday, so he's bringing her some cake. He's talking to her when a woman interrupts him saying she thought she was the only one who did that, bring cake on a loved one's birthday. We then see who the woman is, the one who told Augie about the flickering stars and the countdown. Remember, Clarence does not know what she looks like because the security footage was scrubbed of her. She doesn't really say anything threatening to him, but you could tell Clarence was weirded out by her. We also see she was lying about her father being buried there. It was just some random dead person. The point of this scene was to show that whoever this woman is working for knows a lot. Like they know Clarence is looking into all of this and know exactly where he was going to be. We are back with Jack who is at his house. He sees a package waiting for him on his coffee table. The box has his name on it. He has no idea how it got there, but he opens it and it is the VR headset. Now, from what we've seen in the show, it seemed only scientists were getting these headsets, but now we see Jack is getting one. Granted, he did go to Oxford and is quite rich, so maybe the upper class can get them too. So he immediately puts it on, and we notice his world is a little different from Jin's. His is more European themed, while hers is more Asian themed. So I think the headset takes into account your race, or this could just be a coincidence. This is a random thing, but the people who made the TV show made Game of Thrones. The actor here plays Samuel Tarly in it. Anyways, they played a prank on him around season 6, saying this would be his new costume. And the costume in the show looks so similar to it, I honestly wonder if they planned that or not, because that is all I thought about when seeing this. Sir Thomas More and Follower come to greet Jack, and Jack being a video game player does what all gamers would do in this situation, punch the guy in the face. Like, this would be the exact thing I would do. Very relatable. He starts grabbing Thomas, trying to see how realistic the NPCs are. This is just a very funny moment in the show, so different from Jin's introduction to the game. We are now with Will. He is teaching a class. He is talking about the many worlds theory, so the multiverse. He says that even if your consciousness ends in one world, it could continue in another. Which kind of relates to what we see next. We then see him leave the cancer center. Turns out he has cancer. Jack and him are having lunch. Jack is telling him about the game, about Thomas More and how King Henry VIII was there as well. The game seems to take real life figures from history and puts them in it. Anyways, Will tells Jack he has pancreatic cancer, stage four, and he only has two to six months to live. Jack says no. They will go get a second opinion somewhere else. Will says that he's too far gone. Jack once again says no. You gave up on physics because you thought you weren't smart enough. You gave up on Jin because you thought she was too good for you. 
You are not giving up on your life. Will says he will try. So we get some new info here. So it seems that him and Jin never actually dated. He just had a crush on her and never had the courage to ask her on a date. This makes the first episode a little confusing, but whatever. We're back with Jin. She is back in the game. She has made it to the entrance of the pyramid. She is carrying the dehydrated girl on her back. She walks into the Great Hall and the Count of the West is talking to the Emperor. The Count is telling the Emperor that he has made a code that can predict the movements of the sun so he can predict when they will be in a stable era and for how long. Jin realizes what the Count is making in I Ching. A I Ching is a divination text that is used for guidance and decision making. It is not scientific. It does not obey the laws of physics. It is more prophecy than prediction. She explains this to the Emperor as well. The Emperor asks the Count when the next stable era will happen. The Count uses the I Ching and tells the Emperor in eight days, a stable era will begin and will last 63 years. Quite a bold claim. They speed up time to eight days. The Emperor sees a beautiful blue sky and sees that the Count was right. He awakens his dynasty and screams rehydrate. The guards in the building run into the towers on the backside of the pyramid. It seems this is where they were storing all the dehydrated people. The guards start throwing these skin bundles into the water, causing them to rehydrate and bringing them back to life. Jin sees this and throws followers bundle into the water as well and she rehydrates and is back walking around again. Jin looks up at the sky and sees the sun seems to be getting farther away from them. She realizes that the Count of the West was wrong about the stable era. The Count and Emperor see it too. A great snowstorm starts coming their way and engulfs the mass of people who were just rehydrated. All Jin can do is watch as Follower and the rest of the Emperor's people freeze to death. She is surrounded by the dead. We then see the lady who kept killing Jack earlier. She tells Jin that Civilization 137 was obliterated by extreme cold. You did not save them, but you did establish the superiority of science over mysticism. In level 2, you must use science to save the next civilization. So she has made it to level 2. The goal in level 1 was to establish science as a means to solve the problem of chaotic and stable eras, not by some supernatural means. The camera pans to the sky and zooms out to a man watching a litany of screens, monitoring people's progress in the game. He starts typing away. So this man has something to do with all this, but is he the big cheese or just some low-level guy? Does each player have their own guy who monitors them? And what is the grander point of the game? Like Jack said, it has to be bigger than just figuring out when stable and chaotic eras will occur. So many questions and so few answers. We're now with Clarence. He is meeting with Supervisor Thomas Wade. Wade wants to know what he has found out about Evans. Evans is the super rich guy who was at Vera's funeral. Apparently, Evans likes to pay for things. Anti-vax propaganda, 5G conspiracy theories, and anti-science politicians around the world. Wade says he would bet money that somehow he is involved with the rest of the stuff going on as well. Clarence started digging stuff up about radio telescopes after the stars blinked. In 1977, Ohio State University detected a 72-second sequence. It was believed to be an attempt at communication from another world. They were never able to decode it, though. Only one other observatory detected this sequence, one in northeast China, Red Coast Base, which is where the flashbacks take place. Clarence also says that Mike Evans happened to be living in northeast China in 1977. So aliens being behind what has been happening seems very likely. And it seems very likely that Mike Evans is working with them as well. But that goes back to the question, what are they planning? Why do they want science to stop on Earth? We're now in 1977 following Yao Wenxia. She visits a young Mike Evans. She asks him why he is here. He says he is here to save lives, but not human lives. He is trying to save a bird, a subspecies of northwestern brown swallow. So clearly he's an environmentalist. The loggers have been cutting down all the trees in the area and Mike Evans has been planting a bunch in their stead. Evans asks why they are here. When Sia says they are looking for a site to build a lab, Evans was not thrilled to hear this. If they build it, it will ruin an entire ecosystem. He asks them to leave. When Sia sees the book, A Silent Spring, on his dresser, this is the book that has sent her down the path she is on now. Before leaving, she tells Evans a quote from it. 
She tells him she will try and stop them from building here. So this explains a few things. It explains why Evans was at her daughter's funeral in the first episode, because he knew her mother. It also explains why Evans knows about aliens. Wincia must have told him about it at some point. So Wincia could be working with the aliens as well in the present. She did give Jin the VR headset, and it is still kind of weird it allowed her to play, but not Jack. Was this planned by them? They are back at Red Coast. Wincia tries convincing Yang to switch locations, but he refuses, saying that it is the perfect location. Commissar Lee agrees with him. Yang believes Wincia was just trying to switch locations because she was trying to help the American. Yang seems a bit jealous here, to be honest. Wencia is annoyed with him, but Yang says he can do something for her. A bunch of new arrivals came to the work camp, and he has a list of their names. There is a girl who arrived who used to be part of the Red Guard. Tang, last name I don't know how to pronounce. It's on the screen. You can try, I suppose. She is the person who killed Yao Wencia's father. When Sia goes to see the woman at the work camp, as you can see, a work camp is basically a prison. Tang is looking through rocks. A guard informs her she is a visitor. We see that life has not been too kind to Tang. She is missing an arm. Would Sia would like to hear Tang repent? At least say sorry for killing her dad. Tang then goes into this whole backstory about how hard her life was. Anyways, she is not going to repent. She doubles down even, saying she would have done it again. We are back at the radar station when Sia is doing work while she listens for any messages from otherworldly beings, and they pick something up. She is shocked. She's been working there for eight years and nothing. Like, I would assume she thought it would never happen, but it's happening. The message from the alien says, Do not answer. I am a pacifist on this world, and you are lucky I received your message. Do not answer. If you do, we will come, and your world will be conquered. When Sia sends a message back, saying, Come, we cannot save ourselves. I will help you conquer this world. So when Sia is working with the aliens and Evans in some capacity, that much is certain. So why did when Sia decide to betray the human race? A lot of things got her to this point, but I believe when Tang refused to repent is what broke the camel's back. This person did something horrible, and yet she couldn't care less about it. When Sia sees a lot of humans think like this, which is why she believes humans are unredeemable. That someone like this alien race needs to help fix humanity. And that is the end of episode 2 from the Three Body Problem. What did you think of it? Leave it down in the comments below. And if you want more Three Body Problem content, please subscribe and like the video. Check out the Twitter link in the description below. And as always, have an awesome day.